So I'd like to reconvene this meeting for the Board of Directors for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for November 16th, 2023. Molly, would you take roll again, please? President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Maygood. Here. Director Ackman. Here. I'm having a little trouble with my video, so forgive me if I'm not on camera at the moment. Okay, we will. Once again, CTV, can you please promote another? Okay. Um, we have nothing to report out from any actions taken during the closed session this evening. Um, Carly, are you aware of any changes to the agenda? Staff has done. Okay. Um, I do have uh, two procedural changes to make to the agenda as far as the order of items that we're covering. Uh, we're going to start with the uh, Proposition 218 outreach um, and uh, then cover the two change orders for the Ulta via Drive issues. Then we'll go into recent interactions with Big Basin Water Company. Uh, covering the Prop 218 outreach first uh, because Director Ackman uh, needs to uh, bow out for a work-related board meeting that she needs to attend. So uh, those procedural changes, I will then ask uh, any oral communications from members of the public on subjects within the jurisdiction of the district that are not on the agenda this evening. Um, the one. <coughs> I'm Jim Bozier, uh, Red Payer in Belton. I am presenting on behalf of the Friends of Santa Rosa Valley Water, a local all volunteer citizens group that formed in 2018 with a deep concern for our local community and for continued reliable access to affordable water. We would like to propose that the board increase the benefit amount for the rate assistance program. We recognize that this is not on the agenda tonight and are making our proposal now to give board members adequate time to consider it prior to the December 7th meeting when the board will be deciding whether to adopt the rate study. California now recognizes access to safe, affordable water as a fundamental human right. Unfortunately, the cost of water delivery in California and across the country is skyrocketing due to a wide range of evolving conditions that are very familiar to our SLB community. Aging infrastructure, climate change and droughts, fire and flood damage, among other things. The rising cost of water creates particular hardships on low income households and FSLBW since its inception has placed a high priority on mitigating that hardship. We advocated for and supported SLBWD's adoption of the rate assistance program, which currently provides qualified households a $10 credit for each month on their water bill. The rate study now under consideration proposes to increase the RAP benefit to $15 a month in the first year, increasing the benefit to $20 a month in later years. FSLBW applauds this increased benefit, but believes it is insufficient in light of the large rate increase that's being considered. So we are urging the board to consider increasing the RAP benefit proposed in the rate study. We suggest any of three options for increasing the benefit. You can increase the benefit to equal the increase in the base rate applied to all households. The proposed rate study would increase the base rate by $12.70 in the first year, so the RAP benefit would increase to $22.70 and increase each year thereafter by the amount of the base rate increase. Or you could increase the benefit to 50% of the base rate, as is done in the East Bay Municipal Water District. Using this formula, the new RAP benefit would be $24 increasing each year after, uh, after that by the rate base rate increase, 50% of the base rate increase. Or you could simply increase the benefit to $20 a month a year and increase it by $5 each year thereafter, which may be the simplest way to do it. We recognize that the program is only benefiting a relatively small group of low-income households and that this is an only a very modest way to assist those in need in our valley. We wish the state would step in and address this growing problem, but unfortunately, the governor recently vetoed a bill that would have provided meaningful assistance for low-income households with their water bill. In the meantime, we believe that SOVWD can take this modest step as a means to help households facing daunting financial challenges 
and who will be the most hard hit by the proposed rate increase. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Uh, I do see one uh, remote attending, Mark Dolson. <coughs> All right. So I just want to briefly expand on, on Jim Mosher's comment. I, the way I see it, you know, districts across the state are, are struggling to contend with escalating cost of water, and rate increases are an unavoidable response. And I see SLVWD trying as hard as it can to, to minimize the negative impact of its rate increase on, on those rate, rate payers that are least able to afford it. So from this perspective, the rate payer assistance program is, is just a tool that the district can employ in pursuit of that goal. It doesn't really matter whether the program should properly be funded by the state. The only really relevant question is whether the district can adjust the program to improve its positive impact. So I appreciate that the district is open to doing this. And I just think we want to push a little harder on exploring this option. Because as near as we can tell, only a fraction of the ratepayers who are eligible for the program are actually subscribed. It's hard to know what that fraction is, but maybe one third. This suggests that you know either they don't know about the program or, or they don't find it to be very significant. So that latter possibility is a concern. To assess this, the district could just try increasing the discount from ten dollars to say twenty or twenty-five, in line with the various options that Jim laid out. And at a minimum, I, th I think this response would provide useful feedback. So for example, there's $25,000 allocated for this today and it's not being used fully. It would cover about 100 rate payers at $20 per month. If, if more than 100 tried to sign up, this would tell the district that allocating more money to the program really will have a significant impact on the community. That would be valuable information. Otherwise, I feel like the program is, is really just window dressing. So thank you. Okay, um, Larry Ford. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to, I'd like to endorse what Jim Mosier and Mark Dolson just said, and just say that I think this is one of the few ways that the water district and the ratepayers could proactively make the cost of water more affordable, and I think it would be a a good test of the assumption that more people, more eligible ratepayers would join the ratepayer assistance program. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't see any others uh, wishing to uh, participate. Um, we're online at this point. Um, Anybody else? If not, we'll move on then. Um, first, we'll start with the uh, Prop 218 outreach. Um, and Carly, are you, I think the memo's from you. So. Yes, I'm happy to present unless Jamie wanted to present, but I'm prepared to. Please. Okay. Uh, please go ahead, Carly. Hey, uh, acting <laughs> GM, please yes. proceed. All right. So in April of 2023, the district kicked off its rate study process with Reptelis, the firm we consulted with. Um, so over the last few months, Reptelis and our staff have presented to the board and public regarding the rate study process. And in order to expand outreach around the rate study and the potential upcoming Prop 218 process that we're, we could just go through, we've requested that Miller Maxfield, our consulting outreach firm, um, help with this effort in getting the messaging out to the public. And we brought this item to the admin committee on November 3rd um, and received direction to move ahead with Miller Maxfield to produce mailers to the public, as well as social media, paper ads, newsletters, and press releases. Um, part of the initial effort will be a, a mailer that will go out on November 27th to inform the public of the, the vote around the rate study acceptance at the December 7th meeting. Um, the example of that postcard that will be mailed out is within this agenda packet. And then we also are preparing social media um, posts as well, but those aren't complete. And we do have some pricing around ads if the board is interested in that. 
Um, outside of that, we have also <laughs> agreed with the committee that we'll put together a detailed FAQ around the Prop 218, um, if that's the way we end up going. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And if Jamie, uh, it's the president of the admin committee, wanted to make any additional comments, that'd be great. Okay. Jamie? Yes, I, I would like to add. Um, so just returning to the um, previous board meeting, when we discussed uh, outreach on this item, um, we, uh, you know, one of the things that we had talked about was doing an initial meeting in advance of the December 7th uh, 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 rate study presentation to the board. And what we concluded at the admin uh, committee meeting was that our time would be spent, better spent um, putting as much effort as we could into to, um, outreach and advertising to let people know what was going to be considered at that December 7th meeting um, and directing them to, uh, you know, additional information uh, as described by Carly, rather than attempt to rush, hold a meeting in advance, and then have the December 7th meeting. So there will be additional public outreach efforts, as the board has already discussed, following the, the December 7th meeting, should the board vote to uh, move the uh, to a Prop 218 process, but um, we thought that this would be the wiser use of our resources in the interim. And I'll turn it back over. I don't know if Jeff would like to make some comments as well. I think you've covered it well. Okay. Uh, I do have a question on the uh, covering memo. Uh, page 84 of the agenda packet. Next steps of the rate study. Uh, the board rate authorization is shown as November 16th. Uh, that was pulled from a previous uh, memo item, unfortunately. Okay. So updated. the dates on this are incorrect then. Okay. The board rate authorization would be December 7th, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, that's the one question that I have on this uh, agenda packet. Uh, so, Bob? Um, having been through two of these fairly closely, one of the things that I noticed at both the 2013 and 2017 <clears throat> is that um, people tend to come to the hearing, if they come, with questions about how to vote. It, it's like we're missing a step along in, in between when we say we've adopted it and when we have this public hearing. It's like there needs to be another one in there to allow people to come and ask questions if they decide not to contact anybody at the district or they want to have questions in a way that uh, would allow more of a discussion around the, the question. Mm -hmm. um, as you all know, um, Prop 218, with, uh, in line with many other uh, state laws and regulations, requires a certain minimum that public agencies have to do. I, I'm never in favor of doing the minimum because to me, the, doing the minimum basically is telling your community, we're, we're not really gonna go to any effort to um, actually engage with you on this issue. And while I appreciate the fact that we'd be sending out things um, uh, and doing some social media and that sort of thing, we're, we're still missing that piece. And I guarantee you we're gonna have people at the uh, what is it, the February meeting um, that are going to come with questions. And at that point, it's really too late to do anything in terms of voting. Um, I also noticed at least this particular postcard does the same thing that previous um, communications did. I mean, I have the ads from both 2013 and 2017, where the sales pitch was, we're going to do infrastructure. The reality from both of those rate increases is that more than two thirds of the money went to operating expenses. That was not discussed at all in any of the sales material. Um, so we're, we're kind of proceeding down the same the same path. Uh, to me, this is a, you know, generally speaking, uh, it looks like we're just following the same playbook that we followed in the last two times. And I, I don't expect any real differences and outcomes uh, on that should the board choose to uh, adopt this. Um, if we're interested in doing something different, 
then I would suggest having a two hearings, one hearing in January, one hearing in uh, February, and that's where we'd be inviting people to actually come with questions. I have it more of a um, public uh, hearing slash workshop so that we can be a little bit more interactive as opposed to the rigid rules that we operate the board meetings by. Um, again, that's just based on my experience with having gone through two of these. The 2013 was extremely contentious because of the proposal to build the Taj Mahal. And the 2017 was contentious around the rate at which the initial rate was going up and the total rate, I think, went up like 65% for the average bill. Um, this one doesn't have quite 65%, doesn't have quite the step, and we're not building a Taj Mahal. Um, so um, some of the uh, uh, emotion around that may not be the same, but I think that's even more reason to uh, try to do something a little bit different this time uh, to do real engagement and transparency with the community. Okay. Gil? Um, <clears throat> as rarely as it happens, I agree with Bob on this one. <laughs> is mm -hmm. that I think that... Careful, I'm going to be struck. <laughs> <laughs> Lightning from the sky. <laughs> um, I, I haven't had the experience with the 2013 or this 2017, but I, I did have the experience with the rate surcharge, the flyer surcharge, and I found it very uncomfortable to see us basically having the hearing and people just showing up and some of them honestly had honest questions. And, you know, in the, the way it was a regular meeting didn't really allow for us to have a lot of back and forth. <laughs> and so I, I think that um, the, the other thing that I'm concerned about is the timing of outreach. I mean, I think it's good that we're gonna let people know that a decision is made on the 7th to move forward with the Prop 218 process. But when people are really gonna pay attention is when they get that notice in the mail. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need, I think, some kind of workshop community meeting mm -hmm. um, that's between when people get that and uh, you know, say a, a week or two after that and a week or two before the meeting at which 45 days later or whatever, um, that we can answer people's questions. And as Bob says, not have it a, a formal meeting, but mm -hmm. have a, a more of a workshop kind of thing. So what what is what is the admin group talked about for that? So one of the potential strategies listed here was to have an informational public meeting in advance of the Prop 218 approval meeting. Um, likely the week of 11:27, and we looked at it and said, "Wait a minute, we look at Thanksgiving." And then, no, 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 no. I'm talking mm -hmm. about after the notice comes out, which is yes. going to be sometime the end of end of December. Okay, so you're talking afterwards. Yeah, because that's when people are going to go, "Oh my God!" Right? Or okay. have true questions. Well, depending on how much information is in the notice, right? How specific it is around what their bill is going to be like. Yeah. And I apologize. I think the the memo, the cover letter, or cover memo here is a little confusing, um, especially because the original dates were posted as part of this and yeah. wasn't updated. Right. But what we talked about in the admin committee was having a public open house or a meeting mm -hmm. uh, that would address questions prior to the vote. So after the mailer goes out about the Prop 218 process, we'd hold some type of public mm -hmm. meeting or an open house to allow everyone to come and ask some questions. And then we would have the actual work, the actual yeah. vote on and the board. What kind of, what week or time frame do you think you were targeting with the admin committee's discussion on that, given we start the process on December 7th or 8th? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do have a schedule that Miller and Maxwell, unfortunately, they weren't able to give me the information prior to the, the agenda needing to go out, but I do have additional info information. So if I can have a moment, I'll look into that. Bob has another question. I do have a question about it. Um, I, you know, the, my reaction to the open house part, this isn't really a social event. This, this is, we're talking about money. Um, either a workshop or a hearing. Um, I really want it to be somewhat, come across as somewhat formal with a, in, in terms of 
this is real, guys. Um, come and mm -hmm. ask your questions. Uh, I, I don't want this to come across as a sales pitch or a or a, um, uh, a social event. Um, that again, that's just my opinion. But uh, you know, this is oh, real life. I agree. Is uh, since you've discussed this at the admin committee meeting, is Miller Maxfield uh, ready, prepared to support this workshop? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. With whatever other uh, materials we think we would need for that, mm -hmm. uh, as far as some type of a presentation. Yes, and it looks okay. like in the scope they've provided, they have the public meeting occurring in January, but they don't have a specific date this time. So mm -hmm. um, that will need to be determined, but it would happen after the mailer goes out and then prior to the meeting with the board. Right, okay. Well, does the mailer not need to have workshop date? It, yes, absolutely. Should. Okay, That's true. And then before we finalize the mailer, it has the committee to, oh. to hone in on that. Sorry, when was um, the mailer going? If I could make a quick point or two. If I have any. Sorry, Jeff, I asked when the mailer was going out exactly. Can I jump in here? And sure. I might be able to answer as well. I was, was going to transition to Jamie. Yeah. Um, there will be more than one mailer. So we're, we're doing a mailer in advance of the December 7th meeting and a mailer after the December 7th vote. The admin committee is meeting again at the beginning of December, and we'll have an update from Miller Maxfield at that time. And um, we'll look at dates for the public outreach workshop uh, it, it, uh, at that point. Um, my recommendation, because I do this professionally, is that those kinds of workshops are not typically board meetings. The board members may attend, but they may not necessarily need to participate. They're typically led by staff, and it's an opportunity for staff to respond directly to the public with their questions. Um, certainly, it's an opportunity for us to listen in, but there's not a vote that's being asked of us, so it's not a formal uh, a board meeting in that sense. Okay. I, I have an issue with that. Okay. So one of the things, the other, one of the other big things that bothers me about these, the Prop 218 is um, the manner in which it's conducted. And I understand that it's in the constitution. I don't think people really understood they were voting on an anti-democratic reverse vote when they voted for it. The focus was on the other part of 218. Um, if we're, if we're not going to have um a board meeting or a meeting where dissenting voices can be heard or other points of view can be heard, not only by the public, but by the board members. And I will obviously offer a dissenting opinion. Then it just becomes another sales job. Um, and uh, I, uh, it, again, if that's what the board wants to do, you know, we can certainly do that. Um, but, um, Regular ballot measures, regular votes always have the both sides, both arguments. And there's a debate around it. This Prop 218 process tends to, again, in the past, stifle any kind of debate. It's it and it, it then becomes much more of a sales job. So that's my input okay. into what she was talking about. May I? Uh, let me let me go to Jeff first, Jamie, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. So I didn't hear Jamie say that board members wouldn't be attending or wouldn't be available to answer questions, only that it would not be board members running the meeting and we would not be dominating all the discussion. Is it going to be three minute? Is it what, what, again, how, how, what, what is the, what is the forum by which a board member is able to participate in a meaningful way, answering questions, providing a dissenting opinion, providing okay. dissenting information, et cetera. That's not Jamie. clear at all. Jamie? Yes. Um, okay. So board members have lots of opportunities to offer their views. Um, we have multiple board meetings where we have discussed the rate study. We'll have a public uh, hearing where we will have an opportunity to hear from you, Bob. We'll have the vote on the 7th where I'm confident we'll hear from you there. And of course, we'll have the final decision in February where again, 
opposing board voices can be heard. The point of a public workshop is to actually hear from the public and not the board. And that means that the public will have an opportunity to get up, give their comment if they have dissenting opinion and ask their questions. They can, the, the staff then takes those comments in. There's, they're provided in a report back to the board if there's board members are not in attendance and it further informs our decision, but it's actually not an opportunity for you to give another view of your opinion since you've had so many and you will continue to have so many. It's an opportunity to hear directly from the public. Well, well by the way, you know, you all have opinions. We all have opinions. Uh, it's just mine happens to be the uh, dissenting opinion. Uh, well, let, let's be uh, real clear about uh, that. Let, let me interject here for a minute. Uh, Jamie, um, as board members, we're also members of the public, correct? And we're free to attend the meeting, but I feel that we should be also limited to that three minute rule that we're putting on the members of the public. If the That's board is in attendance as a quorum and we comment on an issue before the board, it's a public board meeting. It's no longer a workshop. Okay, we can, if we're here as a we can very easily, and we've done this in the past, have a board meeting and run it as a workshop. It, it is absolutely the way to do it. Um, I'm uh, going to defer to to Jamie on this, and or that's that's my opinion on it. So so the, the I don't committee will take in the view all views offered here in our next discussion. <laughs> right, I believe our policy or policy allows for us to hold meetings like that. Of course it where, does. Okay. Where it's a, a workshop right. or a study session rather than a, a meeting where we have yes. votes. And I, I'd yeah. like to be able to offer information to the public that they may not have thought about and may not have questions yes. about until they hear a dissenting opinion. Okay. Uh, so the admin committee is going to meet further on this. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, Jamie, Carly, you've heard a yep. few points here. Yep. Um, I don't see that there's any uh, motion that we I do have, one uh, have here in front of us. Yes. Let me uh, accept the staff report. That's that's true. Yes, I do see that motion now. Um, let me go out to the public and see what questions uh, we have from the public on this agenda item. And then we'll come back. Mark? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Jim Osher from Felton. Um, I <clears throat> just, I'm, I'm was very pleased to hear about the idea of a workshop. I thought that, that as uh, Bob and, and Gail said, I thought that was a missing piece of this. <clears throat> so I was very pleased to hear that you're considering that. Um, in terms of the information that's out so far about this, the race study, there are two things I think are quite efficient that would be very helpful. I, um, one is, I know there's questions in the community about what the impact of the race study will be on the school district. Um, and so I hope that that could be very explicitly laid out based on their usage uh, this year, what will they be paying in the next five years so that uh, we can, uh, from what I can tell, I'm on the Budget Finance Committee and I tried to figure it out. I couldn't really figure it out because I don't know what their usage is. Um, no, because the, they're a fixed the, rate, they'll the, be less. The, they'll yeah, be paying so I less. think it's going to be less, but the base rate's going up. So I just think the community will want to know that. We know that the school district board will be very interested. Mm -hmm. um, and I was pleased with the proposal, making it look like the school district will at least have a very modest impact, if not actually a reduction. And secondly, from my reading of it, the main increase is going to be in the summer among heavy users. We have gardens, um, and that is not clear in the way it's been presented so far uh, by the by the ref tell us. So I think we need you really need people going to know who's going to get really impacted by this. I, so I would just encourage the admin committee uh, and, and to get the consultant to develop some material that will help will clarify who's who's paying what. Um, uh, and from my read, that's who's going to really have the rates go up. Okay. Um, other participants, um, 
I see you have your hand up, Mark Dolson. Uh, you want to comment yeah. on this further, or is it still left? Okay. <laughs> I, I actually do have a comment. It's really a question. As a member, a public member of the admin committee, there are some things I'm unclear on, and, and it might be possible for Jamie or Carly to comment. So, for example, I don't know what sort of presentation is envisioned at the December 7th board meeting. I don't know whether it will be a presentation by Ref Tellus or by Miller Maxfield or by none of the above. I don't know, secondly, what opportunities the admin committee is going to have to, to actively collaborate with Miller Maxfield as they develop materials to be presented as opposed to simply having them tell us what they've done and accept that it's a federal complete. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jamie, Jamie or Jeff, you want to comment on, uh, in particular, Mark Dolson's? Well, I think it would be good for Carly to uh, explain what the presentation at the December 7th board meeting will look like, because that's not really within the admin committee's purview directly. Okay. okay. Yeah, I believe for the December 7th meeting, unless Heather had something that she was planning to prepare, it would be a staff memo um, and then the board to vote. The other piece that we've talked about as staff is preparing an informational memo that talks through what we've done in the past few years as far as capital improvement projects and other operational changes that have happened. Um, so that would be a separate item, and but otherwise, I believe it would just be a staff report for the rate. Okay. May, may I? Yes. Um, there is a presentation planned with Raf Tellis and myself for the December seventh meeting. Okay. 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 Um, anybody else from from the board, Bob? Yeah. Um, Time is really getting compressed here. When is the admin committee meeting again? So we meet the first Friday of each month, and I just I have the updated schedule here now. Okay. So the postmark for the Prop 218 notices will be December 29th, and then the public hearing would be February 15th. So we have between December 29th to February 15th to hold the workshop. Okay. Okay. Happy New Year. Okay. Um, Okay, the, uh, the other thing, um, in terms of the uses part, I think, I mean, Jim made a really good comment. It was something I was going to talk about anyway, which is who's being impacted. Mm -hmm. um, at one point in time, I had gotten a um, histogram of the number of customers that, that fell into each unit category over a, um, I think it was averaged mm -hmm. over a three or four month period. And this was when Stephanie was here. Um, and I think I got it for both winter and summer. Um, it might be worthwhile to do something like that, where you've got what your rate is if, if you're one unit, you know, up to 20 or whatever it is, um, with before and after, you know, what, what you're expected to pay. I think that would go a long way to precisely addressing um, what Jim was talking about. And do it in a graph form so that it's easier for people, you know, with table underneath it, but the graph so that it's easy for people to grasp mm -hmm. where they are in that. I think that's a really great idea. Um, yeah. okay. Okay. Um, well, then I'd like to make the motion that the board accept uh, the staff report concerning Proposition 218 outreach uh, with the uh, modifications changes uh, that have been reflected in the comments here, uh, in particular on schedule. Second. Okay. So that's, for me anyway, a little bit unclear. Exactly what is it that was changed? What are the specific things that are different from what's in the report? Um, Carly presented... Uh, alternate dates uh, than what's in the report. That was so that that's the the substantial change that I saw. Okay. But if we're just voting on that, that doesn't entirely reflect everything we discussed. No, it doesn't. 
Okay, so are we saying that they, the rest of those items, other than the dates, the rest of those items are not part of the motion? Um, correct. Okay, great, thank you. Just one more clarification. Okay, uh, we have a motion in front of us. Uh, Holly? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Falls? No. Director Maygood? Yes. Director Ackman? Can I offer a friendly amendment to the motion, which I think gets at what Bob was suggesting, which is that in addition to incorporating the adjusted dates provided by Carly, that we will um, come back with a plan for a public outreach workshop uh, of format to be defined uh, at the next admin committee meeting. Um, I appreciate the offer. I won't change my vote given the language that you used. I still point offer my friendly amendment. Point of order: once once a vote is happening, you you can't start making amendments. So, if you want to make another motion, or Bob wants to make another motion after this vote, we can do it. But we need to finish okay. this vote. Thank you, Bob. Director Ackman. Uh, I guess I'll vote no because I wanted to make an amendment to the motion. So. I'm not quite sure how to do that. You make another motion. Okay. Well, I <laughs> that would you well, pass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So make... Okay. Uh, do you? I had my hand up, but you know it's impossible I, I... for me to just make a motion. Yes, I didn't see that. Uh, so you've heard what uh, Holly and Gail said. Do you wish to? Offer anything else as far as a motion? I would offer a, a second motion that says that in addition to accepting the changes proposed in terms of dates, uh, that the we will come back with a plan for a public outreach workshop to be held between December 29th and February 15th um, on a date as yet to be determined. Second. Okay, Holly. Go ahead to yep. the public. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, anybody from the public wish to comment on that motion? Uh, seeing nobody else from the public left online. Uh, oh, I do see two. Okay, seeing nobody from the public. Uh, President Smalley. Sorry, I didn't have a, I didn't have a quick comment. Okay. Um, again, I appreciate Jamie doing that. I could vote for something that um, had some specificity around it. Right now, it's, it's not something that I could support, though I appreciate the effort. I'm looking forward to what comes back, and hopefully that will be what I can support. Okay. I'll President leave. Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Falls? No. Director Mayhood? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, change order items. Um, the Ulta Via Drive main replacement project. Uh, Let's see, uh, Carly, you submitted this to us. Uh, for you. I'll allow a district manager or engineering manager, Garrett Rolf, to introduce okay. this item. Promoted. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, staff's recommendation is that the board directors review this memo for contract change orders one, two, and three and authorize the acting general manager to approve the Anderson Pacific Engineering Construction requested change orders one, two, and three for the Alta Via Drive main replacement project. The background on this, the Alta Via neighborhood, including Alta Via Drive, Lenny Way, and Prospect Avenue, uh, were damaged by the 2020 CZU fires, destroying above ground water mains in the area, as well as several homes. Our currently ongoing project includes installation of a permanent pipeline beneath the roadway, which will replace the temporary fix in place since 2020. The current project is also 
greatly increases the number of fire hydrants in the neighborhood. The construction contractor Anderson Pacific has been performing well with minimal delays and no issues from local rate payers. They have submitted to us the following items for which they are requesting additional payment. PCO one, material cost escalation. Bits for this project were submitted in late January of 2022, and the project was awarded in February of 2022. From February until April of that year, material shortages caused prices and delivery times for ductile iron pipe to skyrocket. In April, staff was presented with updated material bids from four suppliers showing cost increases of 15 to 20 percent. Can, can I stop you? Yeah, sure. Just a bit. Sure, sure. Thing. Um, if you're reading these three to us, yes, yeah. uh, verbatim, uh, unless there's a reason why these have to be read into the record, no, because they're already printed. That's what um, I mean. I think we're good okay. with these. Um, do you have anything else to add beyond what? we've read in the memo that you want us to consider before we begin the discussion. No, I'd be happy to take the questions. Okay. All right. Uh, then uh, let me lead off with just a comment on this first. Uh, I think the cover memo for these change orders is concise to the point and provides appropriate uh, explanation uh, of what these change orders are uh, from my perspective in going through these. Uh, Joel wrote these? Yes. Thank him for I will. For I will. So, okay. Um, with that, uh, let me go to the rest of the board and see what uh, comments and questions we have on these. Jeff? So looking at these, um, I don't see how we get around the fact that the cost of the pipe went up. Uh, that's, you know, the sun also rises. Um, I did have... A question here, if I can, if you can give me a second here to look at this. Um, there's one where we encountered a culvert. Whose culvert was that? I believe it would be the county's culvert. And it was apparently in bad repair, so we... we put our pipe underneath the culvert and repaired the culvert too? Correct. Um, if that's the county's culvert, shouldn't we be asking them to chip in on repairing it? That sounds reasonable to me. I, you know, you know it's, it's obviously not our- thousand dollars Well, it's not a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, if it were 70,000, I yeah, might- Yeah, if it was 70,000, yes. Why poke the bear? Yeah. Okay. Thirty-five hundred bucks. Um, what was the other one here? No, that was really the only one I had on that. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. We're focused only on this first yeah. change, change order. Yeah. Uh, Gail. See so what? Just questions on the first one. Do you want to go through? No, I'm sorry. Part? The first agenda item. Okay. Yeah. So I have. Uh, um, a couple of questions, and, and I want to make it clear that I realize you're sort of in the awkward position of of uh, cleaning up things that happen that you have no responsibility for, and I because it's all before your time. So I I fully appreciate this. So, um, but I I guess I was I understand the problem with the prices going up, but the amount that went up was well beyond the level that uh, the district manager or you know, our general manager should can uh, approve on his own. And so I'm just trying to understand what, you know, normally the process would be. It seems a little bit too casual that just the chief engineer can just say, yeah, we'll reimburse you for this. I mean, that when I saw that email, I thought, mm -hmm. you know, that, that seems like there ought to be a little bit more of a formal interaction. Um, and at what point would this have come back to the board saying, this is a lot more expensive than we thought? And th this is a question. I just don't know what the policy My is and is what it should, should have come to the board prior to acceptance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any amount over what the district manager can approve. Okay. On, on that point, though, do, do I recall, though, that did we approve the contract 
explicitly with the fact that we would pay for I'm Delta. almost positive we had a materials I, escalation. I, I, yes. I am yes. positive we had it in there, but yeah. I, I wanted to make sure. Yeah. What I don't know is whether we had any limit on it. Yeah. Right. In terms of what could we be agreed to this. without it coming back to the board. So I think that's it's a really good point. And I think we probably need to clarify that in future yeah. contracts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that uh, yes. we're not buttoning up the project and and waving goodbye and oh here's another blank check yeah $150,000 worth of change orders and we're finding out about it we're in a position of what else can we do at this point as the boards other than say yes if it had been brought to our attention maybe we would have said yes to HDPE yeah that, that was maybe. my response but you don't have that choice Agreed. or that you know, input to be able to offer okay all right Gail yeah, that, 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 okay. that answered that. I have another question on the, on the third one, um, where we had encountered the uh, the pre-existing one and a half inch pipe, and apparently it was not where people thought it was. And this, you know, was a fairly expensive fix. And I guess, um, do we not do things like go out with a magnetometer and figure out where things are so that we don't do this? I mean, I'm just surprised that we would um, not go out and figure out where the pre-existing lines are and make that determination accurately before we start putting in the alignment of a new pipeline. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's somewhat shocking the amount of information that we don't have on our own system. <laughs> Um, commonly, one and a half inch is going to be plastic, and you're not going to pick that up oh. in any utility uh, search, uh, other than if it was leaking and you were bubbling into it. Or, like, or if you put it out. Well, it depends on the age of it. Yeah. Most of these we're replacing are old. They probably yeah. wouldn't be metal. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, yeah. I, I will say, I mean, this is not the first time that the district has found. Yeah. A service pipe that no one knew about. Yeah, um, yeah. that's ours. That's ours. Yeah. I mean, you know, just yeah. down the road from where I live, there was a pipe that was supposed to be here, and it was over here. And you know, I think there was a service line over on the cottages. And it, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Bob. Yeah, I was going to ask about the same thing that, that Gail did, and and. Say, but it, since it's a service line, it probably didn't get covered in the inventory that that, that we did, right? So, is what it is. Um, I did want to echo what uh, briefly what um, Mark said. This was a really great memo that explained things very very clearly, and I appreciate you doing that. One question I had: Have we had any issues with Anderson Pacific relative to noise or? Uh, anything like that like we've had in other places so anderson pacific they're staging out of uh middle and riverside drive over in brook loman and i think the neighbors are a little perturbed with that usage on that property it's a zoned residential property and they're doing construction staging out of it but are they there at 7 30 in the morning back up uh, beepers going off. I don't have any particular okay. right. <laughs> information on that. Right. No one's complained, so probably right. not. Right. I, I think right. Rick Moran lives over there, the former board member, and his wife Chris, and they've called me a couple times uh, expressing their displeasure with <laughs> construction activities happening in a zone residential area. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then just on the on the culvert, um, I, I am much more concerned about the free ride on paving that we're going to be granting mm -hmm. the county. I don't know how to deal with this, but um, I'm actually surprised, for example, Irwin Way, which is what I drive on a lot, got resurfaced this year. Um, at some point, we're going to put it, but that, that was the first time in the 35 years that I've been here. I'm sure we all have the same stories. We're going to be doing a lot of paving here that we're going to be basically subsidizing the county. 
and uh, it's an issue from, from my point of view. Now, if there's a way we can work with the county to minimize what the paving is while still being good citizens and all that, I'm certainly open to do that. I'd certainly like to have a very productive, friendly conversation around it, but we need to do something. To that point, Bob, I've already had the thought of, uh, and it's in my notes, I want to begin to address that at an engineering environmental committee meeting. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and, and have a more open discussion with staff. What are our policies mm -hmm. for the different roadway types that we're working in between county, state, private? Uh, and let's get so that we as a board understand well, what are the district constraints to, or what are we doing beyond constraints that we're doing to be good neighbors. But let's do that at the end yeah, no, that, that, that's and fine. surface it back to the rest of the board yeah, once we have just that discussion. Issues we need to be aware of. Yep. Other than that, again, I thought it was a very good memo and thank you for spending the time to put it together the way that you did. Okay. Uh, Jamie? No questions. I appreciate the thoughtfulness in the memo. I understood it completely. Okay. Um, and to Jeff's comment about going back to the, to the county for this, uh, if I were the county's engineer and we came to them, uh, we, had no, we had no plans to replace that mm -hmm. uh, at any time soon. Thank you for repairing that for us. Uh, Have a nice day. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I understand. So, I just... It's just uh, but if we know about you know, anything like this beforehand, such as the paving. Yes, but we'll talk about that offline in yeah. another in another meeting. Yeah. So after, <laughs> after the fact, there's nothing there. But right. before the fact, you might say, "Hey, your culvert's collapsing." Right. And uh, yeah. let's split the cost of it. So I'd like to make the motion, and then we'll go out for public comment. I move that the board direct the acting general manager to amend the existing contract with Anderson Pacific Engineering Construction in an amount not to exceed 93,742 and 69 cents for the requested change orders one, two, and three. No second. Okay. Uh, any comments from the public on this? Uh, seeing none here. Uh, And then online, uh, Holly, would you? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Okay. Moving on then to the next uh, change order item, um, which is the Altavia drive replacement uh, specifically specifically on Monin Way for the soldier pile wall. Uh, Our engineering manager will also take lead on this item. <laughs> okay. Okay, so would you like me to read the memo or do you want to just jump into questions? Uh, I, I'm good with uh, going into questions since yes. we have, unless there's anything else beyond what you've reflected here in the memo. I would say the only, no, yeah, it's all in the memo. Okay. All right, uh, then for the rest of the board, the engineering committee uh, did uh, review this uh, previously, um, uh, but I, uh, let's see, recommend to the board review and discuss. Yes, uh, we agreed that to review and discuss, uh, we did not uh, recommend anything beyond that. Uh, so uh, I had a couple of questions uh, at the engineering committee meeting that I wanted to uh, either follow up on or reiterate right here. Um, this is a private road, correct? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Um, and from what I remember before, we didn't do anything to cause the failure where we're uh, proposing to put this uh, soldier pile wall. Is that Am I correct in that? Or? You are correct. Okay. So uh, this was an existing condition uh, in that area prior to us uh, doing our construction. Yeah, I have some uh, additional information if you're interested sure. from the geotechnical report. Sure. So it indicates during the heavy storms of January 2023, the outboard edge of Monin Way failed, 
creating a 30 foot wide by six to eight foot high head scarp. Observation of the recent slide scarp indicates that fill slope has slid in the past as evidenced by buried vapor barriers below the recently installed vapor barriers to protect against erosion and further sliding. Okay, so that was uh, this past winter. The Right, so it's been covered with plastic, and there's other layers of plastic underneath right. that. Right, we're trying to shed water coming and up just, above. Yeah, the water eroding the loose okay. fill. So it's a cut and fill road. Right. So the inboard side is more solid. The outboard side had trash in it, and right. Mm -hmm. um, fill. It's a private road. Um, from looking on. Uh, Google Maps, it looks to me like there are two or three homes beyond where we're going to install this soldier power wall, and it's a dead-end road. It is a dead-end road. Yeah. There are seven meters beyond the location of the retaining okay. wall. Okay, so... Meters so. not necessarily houses, though, right? Because the way that they're configured... Could be make a lot with a meter or something. Yeah. There's additional at least two meters below on Altavia Drive. Right. right. This okay. area is heavily impacted by the CZU fire. Right. Well. So okay. a lot of those homes are no longer standing. Correct. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so at, at most, <clears throat> seven, seven rate pairs right now, maybe... Three. Maybe, maybe three, yeah. Yeah, maybe three at this point. Okay. Uh, did we get competitive bids from any other contractors? There are not any competitive bids at this time. Okay. Did we seek any? We can seek them. Uh, mm. It's what I thought we asked at the committee meeting. <laughs> um, that's what I recollect. But okay. um okay. okay. Um then um given the current condition of the of the road uh and what we're what we have in contract for road rehabilitation repair paving, are we gonna are we likely to see a change order after you put if you put this wall in for and here's what else we're gonna need to do before we finalize the... Yes, the so the contractor and the district and the county, we've already walked both roads. So Alta Via is a county-maintained road. Right. Moden I'm, Way... I'm, speaking, I'm, I'm focused mostly on Moden Way. So we have a right. unit price for dig-out sections, right. which would be uh, six inches of base rock and three inches of AC. And then we have a unit price for AC leveling. So do you think we're going to have more change order? It's for guaranteed bond? we're going to have to pay additional money for paving. Okay. Yes. Are we going to see another hundred and fifty to $200,000? I anticipated this road to be between $16,500 and $22,000 in addition to the contract uh, amounts for paving. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, those are my questions at this point, uh, Bob. You were in the meeting with me. What other questions do you have? Yeah, I mean, the, the chief question I had, and I, we have our attorneys here, I think, uh, is whether or not this will be considered gift of public funds, given that this is a private road. Mm -hmm. yeah. If it's a gift of public funds, um, um, yeah, please. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't know that we've had the opportunity to analyze it. My first reaction, um, without having specifically looked at it for that criteria, is that it would not. It would. It. It sounds like it would meet the criteria to, to not be that. Meaning that there is enough benefit to the district, um, you know, that you wouldn't. But but again, I say that as just an yeah. initial reaction without having actually analyzed it, and you can certainly give us direction to look at that issue. Yeah, I mean, that was one of my questions I had. Yeah, for me, is, is the biggest one. I, this does go back to, I think, the general issue that we've talked about already. I won't belabor it too much of really understanding who owns what and, and getting a, a clear picture of that before we go out there. Now, the complicating factor here and why I'm inclined to just go ahead with this tonight is that this is an area that was heavily impacted by the CZU fire. 
And the notion of however many houses are on one way, being able to handle this is like zero um, in terms of them financially handling it. Um, I, I think at, at some point, th there's a collective response to the CCU fire that we have to recognize and deal with. And while I don't necessarily want this to be a precedent setting thing for everything that we might encounter, I, I think in this case, we, uh, we, we need to proceed. Okay. Um, Gail? Uh, I can't agree with that, what Bob just said. I, I, I have a hard time seeing why this is our responsibility at all. Um, it's a failure. We didn't cause the failure mm -hmm. of the road. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I could just think of, there's, there are thousands of places where there are private roads where people would love to have somebody build a $200,000 retaining wall for them. And so I, I just don't see how you can justify this. So I'm gonna vote no. Jeff. <sighs> When I first looked at this, I immediately thought, whose, walk, whose road is this? And, and why aren't they paying for it? Um, how much of this, I mean, you've got the wall, you're gonna have to excavate for the pipe. Uh, are we paving the road also or? So the pipe's already installed. Okay. We cannot pave beyond this road failure unless we build the wall. Okay. Is the rest of the road paved on either side? You know, it is paved except where we've dug the trench and put our pipe in. Okay. It's restoration. Um, paving mm -hmm. in this case is very loosely uh, used. <laughs> uh, so what is the paving? Is What's that? Something is there. Is something is there, but it's very minimal. I've got a, 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 a Subaru four wheel drive and I went up there with it and just. Okay. It's, so it's not sitting on three inches of nice, nice clean asphalt. It's in it's a, a very poor condition for the yes. road overall. Agreed. For for Mona and Way. And Altavia. They're both in very poor condition. This is what's the, why we have to do the dig outs and we have to do the leveling course. Yeah. I mean, again, uh, from a broader policy point of view, um, you know, these are absolutely things we need to address, particularly going forward. But can we conclude the project if we don't do this? Let's say we just said we're not going to do this retaining wall. Uh, what, 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 what then? What happens? The contractor will not pave. He won't even cross it with the slurry truck. So they backfilled with base rock above where the road failure is. So it seems like it would open us up to liability if we don't pave. And Gary, um, correct me if I'm, if I'm misunderstanding, but I thought this retaining wall would also protect our water main. And that was part of the reasoning that we wanted to move forward as well, was if another storm happened and the yes. road failed, it would take the pipe that we just installed with it. I would be very concerned if there was a failure there and we had just done construction and dug up the road and put our pipe underground and then there was a failure and that people would want to blame us Mm -hmm. for the condition. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Jeff? Uh, no, not an easy one to right. Okay, uh, Jamie. Sorry, are we voting or asking questions? We're still asking questions. Okay, so um, I, I think that Jeff essentially asked my question, but it, it sounds like, um, if, if we don't do this, we are unable to ensure that our pipe is protected. But what what was in place before? A uh, tarp with sandbags? No, I mean... Likewise. Uh, oh. Historically. I I mean, it's above grade. It got burned in the CCU fire. It's an above grade temporary pipe of HDPE. I mean, basically all of that area had above grade pipe, right? So before the fire hit, it was all above ground, right? So again, this is not uncommon up here. People are just throwing pipe down to serve. 
Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and melted. So now we have another pipe above grade that we're operating with, and the new pipelines installed under the road. So we could continue doing that. Just leave the above ground pipe, not do anything more. The new pipeline is installed. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, that's the alternative. I think mm -hmm. is we just continue serving those places on above ground pipe. If what's in the ground is sunk cost, then bye bye. How much should we spend putting it on the ground? How much is the contract? Just for the mud and way part, not all of yeah. I mean, the pipe is installed, so all the houses are going to be connected to the new main. The only part, portion of the contract we won't be able to do is the paving. Right. Um, so the you won't be able to do paving beyond where you're proposing to correct. solder by a wall. Correct. Uh, and if we serve off of the uh, main as it's installed right now, and a failure happen, oh, uh, it's going to happen where you're proposing to put the wall. If we go back to what Bob is, I think, suggesting above ground. Well, from there, it's, I'm not. By the way, just be clear, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not advocating for it. I'm saying the alternative. That's an alternative. Is you abandon what you installed and you continue yeah. serving them above ground. We could. Uh, Go above ground from there uh, if the failure happens. Um, the pipe is on the inboard side. inboard side, correct? So up against the slope on mm -hmm. the uphill side. Another policy item. Uh, yeah, once you get to the hairpin, there's like a drainage feature yes. with a culvert. It, and it's that drainage feature area where the solder or the wall would go in. It's downhill from the culvert yeah. Yeah. is yeah. where the is where the wall goes. In. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Guys, it's ugly. There, 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 there's no good answer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is, there's, uh, there's no good answer here. Right. It's just I, the least worst. Um, what I was asking for on the paving, uh, the cost, the additional change order cost that we're going to see on that, uh, you gave us an estimate somewhere in the 20,000 range. Uh, okay. Uh, is that based on your discussions with the contractor? Or so? Because I'm still concerned <laughs> about another 150, yeah. 200,000. So the, the contract includes an overlay on the entire road, Bone and Way and Altavia and Prospect. I don't see how you can overlay that the way it is right now. So the only change is subgrade prep. Right. So that was walked with the county. With the contractor on the way. district on all the roads, right? Okay, on the, the entire way. project. Okay, and all right. Mark with spray paint. We got right. unit prices. Okay, and we have square footage from okay. the spray paint. So, Hi, is it so, is between okay. sixteen thousand five hundred? Okay, it sounds like twenty two thousand dollars. Yeah, for the change. I agree. Yeah. For that portion of the to address the sub substandard right. condition of the road, so we can put our overlay down. Right. I mean, it's not to say that it could come back at thirty-five thousand or what have you, but, but it's, they've it's done diligence. One hundred fifty or two hundred, right? Yeah. They've done diligence. Okay. Yeah. okay, which is good. Yeah. Okay. I'm still conflicted on this one. So, okay, I'm uh, I move. Okay, <laughs> the board directs the acting general manager to amend an existing contract with Anderson Pacific Engineering Construction in an amount not to exceed $198,900 for the construction of the modem way soldier pile retaining wall. I'm just moving this along here. No seconds? Right. Okay. I, I, so we have a motion out in front of us. Uh, I, I'm not hearing anybody else at this point. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. Staff needs to come back with a solution. Move on. Yeah. I, I think what I'm worried about is that after last week where we said we had a we were basically being told what to do by the paving company. And I kind of got a sense here that that's also what's happening is that the the paint the paving subcran tractor is saying this is what we want to have happen because it's the best thing for them. 
And there's, I just would like to see some alternative solutions that, so, you know, so on that, because so that, it's very easy for them yeah, because they're sure. not paying for it. So right? on May 8th, uh, the contractor sent an RFI alerting the district to the problem of this existing condition. And my predecessor reached out to Haruku Sinich, geotechnical engineers, and requested that they perform a geotechnical investigation and design a soldier pile wall to address it. Okay. And that's what I presented. Yeah. With. No, I, that's what I'm saying is that you're in this awkward position where and then I want <laughs> Wait, you to. It's so not your work. It's not you. <laughs> well, it's just, I'm just saying that. It solves it, the problem. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah it, it's it's just it. not necessarily our job to pay for all this, I guess. Yeah. Well, we're just in there disturbing things and working. It's. it's a method to solve the problem yeah. sure uh, and it's a uh a very permanent yes uh solution it is so what alternative could you bring to us if it's not this hundred and ninety thousand we contacted the engineer record and asked him about putting a concrete slab on grade over the failed section <laughs> He said that that would not be wise because that's a bearing failure and it would be undermined. Okay. He said, if you don't want to build a wall, you could build like a viaduct, like a bridge. But they, do, sure. but they do a nine in several places. You're not going to be able to get away from a deep foundation because the material at the top is incompetent and failing. So we have to get down into competent material for it to work. Okay. So we could look at a bridge that would probably be just as expensive mm -hmm. or more. I think more. Be more. Yeah. more. Yeah. 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 I mean, you talk about you, I mean, you see what they do on nine in those viaducts. I mean, not that we'd be doing that big, <laughs> but it is a there's a ton of drilling that goes on and concrete and, and all the rest of it. Can't leave out over the failure. Exactly. I, 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 they do it on Highway 9 between uh, Felton and Santa Cruz. They've yeah. done it at uh, Jay's Timberline. Yeah, you guys. Oh, yeah. We, we those are, those are massive jobs. Um, yeah. They've gone okay. all the way down to the bottom so, of Bill Buck. They do. Um, uh, the motion, I uh, can do, we do the motion. Um, I understand. I'm still searching. Uh, so I'll second you, it. You, and we can vote. OK. OK. Um, we have a motion in front of us, Holly, that's been uh, made and seconded. We need to go out to the public. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, comments from the public. Uh, anybody want to weigh in on that? Mr. Martin, please. Yeah, good evening, Eric Martin from Bold Creek. Um, seems to me that you're talking about doing capital improvements to pri private property. Um, my house, my water meter is out in the street and next to the street in the right of way. From my side of the meter to the house is my problem. It seems to me that in trying to fix these folks' problem, line up their meters out on the street, tell them to do it however they want. I mean, why am I going to pay for capital improvements on their property? <laughs> He's paying for capital improvements on my property, except me. Me, the dog. But it seems to me that kind of swimming through the seaweed, not seeing the ocean because the seaweed's in the way. This is all a private property issue. They chose to build their houses there. They chose to build a road with multiple layers of plastic and failed roadbed. So you put lipstick on that pig, you're going to own it. No, we are going to own it. And my point is, if they want those 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 properties to have water, put the meters out on the street, off right off the main, offer them some kind of deal with a contractor. Maybe they can get together and, and go in and mass for the project. But I, I I have a fundamental problem doing capital improvements on somebody else's property. That's not going to really return anything except to those folks. They're not doing anything for anybody else because that's a dead end spur, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it seems to me that's their problem. That road, the culvert, the the lack of a retaining wall, the drainage issue, the bad roadbed. This seems to me that you put anything on top of that, you're going to own it, and it's going to come back, and you will buy it because you're going to say, "Well, it was fine before you got your grubby little bits on it." And even if all you did is put some asphalt on top of it, 
and it slides down the hill. How much is it going to cost to replace? I don't know how long the road is, but let's just say 100 feet of road that slips all the way to the side where the embankment is. Are you going to build them a whole other bridge across that opening? Just, just food for thought. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else uh, online wishing to comment? Uh, Bob has one. Uh, seeing nobody else online. Bob. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly create a solution and, and might be worth looking at. I, I mean, just looking at the map here, I think there'd be access and easement issues um, that, that you would encounter. Um, it may be that everybody will be cooperative. Um, if to do that, you'd also probably be looking at a long line. Um, they would also probably have to deal with a pump situation. Um, yeah, I mean, always look at it. I just want to move this along one way or the right. other. Right. Agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. Agree to either. Because we got to get this and, and that and recognize, I don't know how many feet went into Monin Way, but recognize if you do anything else, you basically just, you know, flush that money. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, that money is probably more than what we're talking about here, uh, would be my guess. Again, okay. going, going forward, we got to have a better policy around private roads. We have a motion in front of us, um, Holly. President Smalley. No. Vice President Hill. No. Director Falls. Yes. Director Mayhood. No. And um, Director Ackman. Might have left already. Left, yeah. But she. Um, I saw her eyes blink. <laughs> She's still alive. Oh, are you still there? No, she said she left at 7.38. Okay. But my vote would be yes if they move and second. Okay. Okay. So can we take that? I think so. It doesn't make yes. any difference, but... Uh, it it, it does for the record. Yeah, she is moving. Yes. Okay. She may be in her other meeting room. Yeah. And not able to participate. Um, just as a follow-up question to the failure, um, how much longer is Anderson Pacific going to be in there or want to be in there? Um, so they have to do a little cross-country portion between Monin Way down to Alta Via. We just got authorization from Environmental to proceed on that. And uh, then we have to swap over all the meters, paving in December. Is, is that a uh, road in the road or in uh, a cross country? That was a cross country. It's through the mountain. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so like in here, paving. Yeah. They're going to be paving December time frame. December. Yes. Okay. You guys got a month to um, yes. figure this out. Yeah. Come back with something else. Or, yeah. So, all right. Uh, we're done with. We're done with that item. Uh, moving on then. Uh, to the recent interactions with the Big Basin Water Company. Um, uh, this is the memo that um, I put together. Um, I had con or the information that we saw uh, in the Santa Cruz Sentinel article. Uh, it was, I think, uh, November 5th, uh, where it was uh, <laughs> describing what went on in the meeting uh, that was held for Big Basin users on November 2nd, referred to the fact that, uh, and we're now providing them water uh, from our district. It was a surprise. Uh, I well, we did authorize the connection. We did authorize the connection, yes, yeah. but the, the recent uh, in August started. But uh, so uh, based on that, uh, I talked to our former general manager uh, and then also talked to Carly to understand uh, what it is that uh, we are doing for uh, Big Basin at this point. So uh, I summarized that uh, in the memo that I put together. Um, and basically, we're sending water uh, to the tune of uh, 93000 a day. Uh, we're being compensated uh, by the uh, 
court appointed receiver for that for that uh, at our residential rate of uh, uh, the twelve uh, sixty twelve sixty six uh, per per CCF. Um, I also had uh, concerns after what I was reading there and from some other uh, media sources about what was being said about the water district and what we were maybe going to do or not going to. So I contacted the uh, court appointed receiver and had a discussion with him. Um, and I've reflected that here in the memo also uh, with what I wanted to convey to him being a uh, conversation to the end with Rick and Rick, Rick was retired, wanted to make sure he knew that. Uh, the district's uh, efforts to evaluate consolidation and where what the board told Rick uh, back in February that you know, cease, suspend further evaluation and the fact that we're considering a rate increase since they're now uh, purchasing water from us. I wanted him to know, be aware of and he was aware of all of those. So um, information that I got from him, uh, the one thing that uh, I have you know, some question on or concern on is uh, our staff further supporting. Uh, because in the past, I'm aware of, uh, we have uh, work that we did on behalf of Big Basin Water Company that uh, the previous owner operator, Jim Moore, asked us to do that we're still not compensated for. Uh, and I don't, I didn't want to see that continue. So uh, I understand from the court appointed receiver that he'd like to engage us in work. Um, and he is the one that told me that, yeah, he'd like us to be able to increase our pump capacity. But I didn't come back to, to Carly at that point to ask any questions on that. I don't know if that was true or if yes, we are following through on that. But between he's asking us to take the pump capacity from 62 GPM to 100, because from my calculations, uh, we're running that pump near 24 hours uh, at capacity to provide that 93,000. Uh, gallons a day. So, okay, he wants to go further to see if we can go further than that. And I think it's so that they can shut their well down to do well rehab work sometime in 2024 so that we could be at maximum capacity and support them instead. That's my guess as to the reason for that. But he did say that uh, it's willing to uh, compensate us for that. So my thoughts were, well, uh, do we want to get some type of a contract agreement in place for our services? So uh, with that, uh, that's what I wanted to convey in the memo uh, as far as what we might do further on this. So I'd like to open it up to the board for questions on this. Uh, we'll start with Gail. Um, I guess what I'm just concerned about is that um, we make sure that we cover our costs on this um, and that those costs are not just the incremental costs. In other words, there has to be some kind of overhead charge that goes with it because our own, our own rate payers are expected to help pay for um, administrative overhead, the buildings and everything else. And so I, I would hope that we would have some kind of contract. Um, I know that there was, we talked about this, gosh, over a year ago and it never happened. Um, but we should have some contract, I think, for providing water. Um, I'm also concerned about what's going to happen when the new rate increase uh, goes through and what exactly we're going to build them. Um, because obviously the, the fixed rate that we have right now of 1266 for CCF is not going to be it, right? And so what, what rate do we charge them at? And then the other is um, some kind of contract for 
providing emergency um, help for them. And I, and I don't think we want to become their, their electricians. We, we want to only be called on in emergencies um, and make it clear that, uh, you know, in emergencies, we have to deal with our own emergencies first. There's a big storm. Um, and I guess finally, I would say that I would hope that um, we make this somehow coherent with what we would do in terms of selling water bulk with Scotts Valley. Um, and I spoke to Dave today about that because I wanted to see, you know, what hey. kind of who's the Look district making. District the manager, manager Scott 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 Scott. Sorry, I just wanted to make that yeah, clear. Sorry. For, for um, and he says that, that they also have paid the 1266, um, which is pretty, you know, expensive for a situation where it was just basically turning a valve at the at the inner tie. Um, mm. And so he was saying that actually uh, he he was engaged or they were engaged with, along with Santa Cruz with a discussion with Raph Tellis to try to figure out what would be the appropriate costs of water that would be shipped along the new inner tie. Mm -hmm. Santa Cruz and Scotts Valley are going to have this big new inner tie. And what rates should be charged for that water from mm -hmm. Santa Cruz to Scotts Valley? And as Dave said, with the potential that they might charge us if we <coughs> bought that water for, from them for, for some reason. So it does raise an interesting issue of whether we should be talking to Raph Tellis about coming up with what, what is an appropriate rate. I mean, obviously, I think the first thing that comes to mind is the industrial rate, right, which is what I think is going to be 10 something going forward, mm -hmm. less than the current 1266 but but i'm not sure that's exactly what it should be with i think we should take advantage of having raftella still working for us to get their advice about you know then that there should be some little extra thing we pay them for to do that calculation for us it would be mm -hmm. good to do it now okay Jeff. so two concerns here um one is that from what I can see, um, the Big Basin Water Company, with or without the um, receiver, is not fiscally solvent at this point. Uh, they're spending more on water every month than they're getting in from their ratepayers. And I know they have a big uh, rate increase request at the Public Utilities Commission, but uh, until that happens, uh, they're spending down the bank account, whatever bank account that the receiver has to work with. So I would say that any agreement we have with them, we need to have um, very strict terms on payment and, and uh, make sure that we don't find ourselves suddenly with them in arrears to us several hundred thousand dollars and no cash. Um, so I, I, I think we, we really need to be sure that in writing an agreement that it, it, it has prompt payment that we are, <laughs> we are willing and ready to turn the spigot off if they miss payments. Um, secondly, I would comment on what Gail said um, regarding the Scotts Valley to Santa Cruz pipeline that they're putting in. And if they put that in, uh, you know, presumably, we were happy to sell water to Scotts Valley at the rates we were selling it, and it was profitable for us, I presume. Um, if they put in a big pipeline down there, we are going to be in a price situation between Santa Cruz and us as to who Scotts Valley decides to buy water if they need more water than they've got wells. So we need to take a look at the impact of that and whether we want to continue selling water to Scotts Valley, whether they want to continue buying from us after they put that pipeline in. It's a future set, it's a future issue that we need to look at. But but I think my my biggest point on you know the more relevant point is uh the big basin that they just don't look like they're a financially solvent business at this point and we need to be very careful. They're not no, they're not. No, we need to be very careful that we get paid promptly, and okay. we need to be very willing to turn the spigot off if they don't pay. 
Bob? Well, I mean, I'd like to start off by saying it's really unclear to me where um, this interaction goes between what staff should be doing and what the board should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lot in here and what Gail talked about that sounds like uh, items that staff should be doing, not the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has been a topic in the past in other contexts, and um, it, it it's concerning to me. Okay. Right. I, I think you should have taken the rather than I mean, if I had contacted the guy, would that have been OK? No. OK. Well, see, there we are. OK. Um, I, I think there needs to be a whole lot more clarity around this because it seems like there's two sets of rules. Um, however, within the context of what we're talking about here, I mean, I also saw something in the, in the paper about them thinking the best thing was for us to buy them. Um, I, I, I think at some point uh, staff should probably have a conversation with them um, about about what a public agency can do um, so that they are providing real information to their customers that, that's solid. Um, if they did something like a Felton, <clears throat> that might be one thing. Um, and I say like because it wouldn't be exactly like, but like that. But to think that the San Lorenzo Valley Water District is going to cut a check to buy the Big Basin Water District, uh, Big Basin Water Company, um, I, hopefully that's not what he meant. Um, I, I would have to see the contract relative to a services. I'm very concerned about this escalating way out of control very, very quickly, and us having very little ability to throttle that. It's not reasonable to say once you're supplying them water that you're going to cut it off. No, it's not. I, I mean, that is not going to happen. No. Right? And I was being somewhat figurative there. I mean, that's that's our... Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think I, th I think we are already... You know, again, we're we're trying to be really good neighbors here. I mean, we've had the filling station up. We, you know, we've been supportive as much as we can. Uh, we did a ton of work around trying to figure out if there was a way to um, make a a merger happen. Neither the state nor the county was willing to put any money on the table at the time. It didn't seem like all of a sudden we have money. Um, wow, that's really interesting. Um, so. And by the way, we're you know we we will never recover those costs that that we invested. So I am deeply concerned about how much further we're getting into this. And I I think this is something that Carly and the new general manager ought to be um, uh, working on. Um, I think the other part of this is all of these conversations need to immediately shift to staff. Period. Um, and with respect to the competition part between Scotts Valley and um, Santa, Santa Rosa Rose. Valley, which you yeah. were alluding to, yes. um, I discussed this at least a year and a half ago in a, in, when the, there was some discussions around this, that candidly, if I were <laughs> Scotts Valley people, I'd be doing exactly the same thing. How do we get an inner tie to both agencies who have significant surface water mm -hmm. uh, resources and play one off against the other when it comes to pricing? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you know, negotiation 101. Yep. Um, and if they can get a deal with both, so much the better. So, um, I, again, but again, I think that is an appropriate activity for staff, not board at this point, unless the board is going to interject itself by taking action approved by the entire board to have these kinds of conversations. Otherwise, you're you're stepping out of bounds of what you're entitled to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. Uh, I do want to comment on that. Um, in my role as board president, um, I reached out to <laughs> uh, the court appointed receiver. Not good uh, enough. I understand your viewpoint on that. I have a different one. So, well, um, we should clarify that in the board policy then, because you're stepping into staff activity. Uh, and if the rest of the board uh, feels so there can't be two rules for different uh, people. If, 
if the rest of the board feels so. Uh, then, okay. <laughs> okay, great. Just so long as we have a two tier system well, here. You and I can disagree, <laughs> okay. but the rest of the board can weigh in on that. Then it, it, um, the policy needs to be uniform or nothing. That is, everybody can do whatever they want or not. Oh, it has to be uniform. Uh, well, it has to be uniform. Uh, we can take that up at the discussion when we review the board policy manual. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for the purpose of this uh, memo and where we are at this point, um, I prepared a, a motion uh, with this <coughs> that I'll read out and then go out for any public comment. Um, I move that the board direct the um, acting slash interim since uh, our interim starts as of Monday uh, to meet with the budget and finance committee to discuss a compensation agreement um, as requested for support services to the big basin water company. I'll second that. Okay. Um, any comments from members of the public? Seeing none online. Go ahead, Eric. Eric Martin, Old Creek. Um, it sounds to me, and I'm not intimately familiar with the big basin negotiations in the water district, but my question, rhetorically or not, is once they're hooked up to the water, are we responsible to repair their system? And no. So then the question is, when that system needs to be repaired, who do they call? Ghostbusters? Or they call somebody. I'm sure the staff, you know exactly how much you pay him in a given day. You know how much gas his truck runs. You know how much his tools average, probably on a monthly basis. And is the I don't know what kind of money the receiver has. Uh, obviously, he's keeping their money in a pool and doling it out as required. But that's going to be on their side. I think of that is what I think of the providing them water is you've got a big pipe going up the hill and the San Lorenzo Valley Water District meter, everything on that side is their problem, just like it is at my house. Everything on my side of the meter is my problem. If we offer services from our skilled staff to work on their stuff, are they are we is is the water district going to be compensated on an hourly basis for the work that they do? That's my question. Is there is there a rate schedule or is there some sort of procedure where the water district can send the receiver a bill for 10 hours of his time for going up and fixing their, their broken pipes? Mm -hmm. And if so, then that's their problem. They have to figure out how they're going to pay for that via the receiver and, and the, the obvious customer base on what they want to do. But it just seems to me that if you if you parse this out and make a very clear delineation between our water system and their water system, and that can, that you can find the boundary, then just offer the services, but make sure they pay for them. There has to be a way for that to come back. Because I know if I don't pay my plumber, he'll attach a lien to my, my property. And there's got to be a mechanism to where the water district can do something like that and say, well, we don't want to own it. We just want our money back. And so all of those members of Boulder uh, Big Basin Water they're all individual members, individual plots. They can, I don't know what the law says, but there has to be a way that they can be individually responsible for any work that's done in their be their behalf. So that's just a thought. Okay. Um, what you're alluding to for us getting uh, paid is what my intention was in a compensation agreement. So, uh, but that's not the details of what we're prepared to do here this evening. My motion was for the Budget and Finance Committee to begin to take up that discussion. That I agree with. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, uh, so we have uh, a motion out in front of us, uh, Bob. I, I mean, I'm just putting myself in the shoes of the interim general manager with, you know, we don't have a great onboarding program here, right? And with all the things that this person's going to have to do, um, uh, it, uh, I would really strongly recommend that we postpone this until after there's an opportunity for the interim general manager to 
deal with the other things that he's going to have to deal with. Um, I don't know if this is a top priority. I don't know if this is something he should drop everything else and work on. I don't know if this needs to be done by X. I don't know a, a lot of things around this, but I do know that from my point of view, this is not anywhere close to the top priority that I, that I would like the interim general manager to be working on when he comes here. Um, and by directing him to do this, gives it that stamp that it's something he needs to take care of. I, I don't think it is at this point. Could, could I make one additional comment here? Um, I think it's incumbent on Big Basin, if they want to talk to us about stuff, to come to us with some kind of proposal. And without, I mean, so far, they haven't come to the board with any to our board with any proposal. They've cut some deals with Rick to buy water and get a pump fixed and a couple of things like that. You are that. the only participant in this conference. Press any key to continue this conference. But I, I think we really don't have to do much of anything other than sell the water at. at book rate um, until they come to us and say, you know, would you do this and this and this, and can we have an agreement, and then we can evaluate it. Do you want to withdraw your second? Um, I'm, I'm sorry? Do you want to withdraw let your me, second? Let me comment on that. Let me comment on that further. Um, the court appointed receiver has already asked staff for work. Am I correct in that, Carla? Yeah. So they're already asking us okay. to do yeah. work. Did they provide a proposal? Um, let me let me finish. They're already asking staff to do work, and they've asked for a cost estimate. Okay, good. Uh, that that you know that 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 is happening. But I wanted the rest of the board to be aware of that also. That 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 is transparent. And if we're okay with that and having staff do that, okay. I still think that the Budget and Finance Committee should have that discussion. That's what the motion was. Put out one. So let's let the interim general manager do his job. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that, that's something. So we have a motion in front of us. Um, Holly? President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Falls? No. Director Mayhood. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Um, we're moving on then to uh, the Lompico Canyon Emergency Evacuation Project. Our engineering manager will take this. Thank you. Um, so the easement was sent to legal to have the uh, amendment added prohibiting the use of glyphosate on district property and we're awaiting uh, the agreement to be returned with that added language. If not, I could read you the memo or take questions. I think we'll take questions. All uh, right. But let's back up a bit from that. Sure. Uh, um, this uh, agreement did come in front of the uh, Engineering and Environmental Committee um, and the recommendation to prohibit the use of glyphosate uh, was from Bob recommending that the easement cover that. Uh, so uh, with that, the e Committee recommended to the board that we uh, directed them to make that incorporation so that we could uh, review the final uh, easement with that in it then. So uh, with that, uh, Bob? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I uh, can we bring this back on December 7th with the language in it? Stand by me. I mean. With the amended language. Yeah, sorry, with the, uh, the, with, the, with, the with the amendment language. Yes, thank yes. you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I have one other quick comment. Um, you also need to amend the signature block on our side uh, because the version that was posted still has Rick Rogers 
Yeah. Name and email address there. So any other That's a comments on that? Gail? Yeah. No, this would be a good thing to get done. So we can get is, is, emergency there is a back road into Lompico. Is that what this is? There was a privately held back road that was gated and they opened it up this winter That's for a needed. while with a county sheriff at each end there. Is this is this the same road that they're talking about? It goes from west to Newell Creek. Okay, I, I don't know where. So those west takes you up to Loch Lomond. Yeah, you know the Lewis tanks. Yeah, so it's right by the Lewis tanks. You go down that road, and there's a gate there, and then it takes you over by where the dump is. Yeah. yeah. I, okay, it's and it's gated. I don't know that area. Yeah, it's gated on both ends. If you go down to the dump, it, you come to the end, and it's okay. gated there. Yeah, because yeah. there was one. There was a privately owned. Road up there that they opened up for a while last oh, winter. Okay, so is that different? Yeah. Okay. That was just because of trees down there. Yeah. So, Gail, any comments, questions on this one? I, I don't care. I'd vote for it tonight or I'll vote for it on the 7th, either way. Okay. <laughs> Gary, uh, is there any rush from the county to have this agreement executed? That yes, the county is wants to execute the agreement immediately. They're ready to go. When do you think you'll get it back from the attorney? It's been, yeah. when did we have the meeting? I mean, uh, that's a good point. We met on the third. Yes. The first week, yeah. yeah, it was on the third. Right. I mean, we're two weeks. Yeah, but the memo was written last week. But, right. but no, in terms of the attorney doing the work, that seems to be a. I haven't received a response yet on that. Okay. Can we ask the attorney? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I can, I can check with Barb and, and get an answer to staff tomorrow. Oh, thank you. All yeah. right, fine with get it turned around yeah yeah okay all right uh, i mean i want to do it okay so i want to do it i just like voting on what it is we're actually doing not yeah okay okay um i don't have an opinion on this as to whether now or uh we do it in two weeks so I don't think anybody, I'm not hearing anybody else from the board jump up to say, push it through now. Yeah, let's bring it back. Okay, bring it back to the uh, December 7th meeting. Yes. Yes, sir. Continue it, continue it until then. Okay. All right. Uh, Moving on then, uh, let's see, the uh, consent agenda. Uh, does anybody want to uh, uh, pull anything from this without any objections? Uh, we can approve that. Uh, seeing none here, uh, district reports. Um, the department status reports. Uh, Gail, any questions? Quick question, question out from the environmental one. I saw that the um, RFP on the Loch Lomond feasibility study received no bids. And do you have any thoughts why? And is does this mean we're going to go back to the drawing board? We're going to go again, or what? Yeah. So the next step will be to reach out to a few of the firms that we've worked for in the past or worked with in the past to get an understanding of why they would propose on this RFP. Um, and from there, we'll most likely go back out for bid. Um, so it's unfortunate. We sent it to, I think, almost 30 different firms that we, we had a list from the city of Santa Cruz, our own list, and we sent it to all of them. Um, no thoughts on this. It's surprising to me also. Yeah. Yeah. And your plan going forward? Was. is trying to get a better understanding why these firms didn't propose initially and then go back out for a bit sure. again. I would, I would hope, in particular, the ones that we frequently get responses mm -hmm. from, like Santa's firm exactly. and some mm -hmm. of the other ones. What's wrong with this one, folks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just going to mention, I, I thought that it um, had something to do with, we thought perhaps we hadn't given enough time that was one of the reasons. They should comment. 
to that effect right. and to lose that. So, okay. Uh, anything else, Jeff? <coughs> Jeff? Oh. Bob? Fish ladder. Yeah. Come on, make a smile. <laughs> Is it done, done? We are out of the creek. The diversion's out. Bypass is out. We still the water worked. looks clean. I know. When, was, did, when, did we, when did we get out? Oh. How far after the... It was the second week of October? Yeah. No. So after the 15th? After the 15th? Before the 15th. It was after the 15th. It was. But we had gotten the extensions from all the permitting agencies. Yeah, I think we'll... Okay. I can look it up. And um, so how much more work do they have to do there before we then get to the um, fencing and the nice, good-looking stuff that we're going to put up around there? Right. So we still have to do some concrete work on the landing. We have to put in the foundations and the staircase going up to the top of the bank. Um, then they have to install the potable water main across the pedestrian bridge. They anticipate all the work being done by Christmas, and then we'll be waiting for the Motor Control Center. That'll be in January or February. So sometime January, we could be putting up the the fence. Completing the revegetation work as well. Yeah, it's something that's, as we talked about before, nice looking, not the normal mm -hmm. exactly. industrial. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, well that that's good. That sounds like maybe a spring um, ribbon cutting <laughs> ceremony. Yes. And welcome the fish in to the to the uh, Um <clears throat> Excuse me. The um, next one was uh, Felton Heights tank. Yes. Yeah, so we've uh, executed the contract with the surveyor. He's been to the site to do the survey. Uh, we need to get the actual document from him and then we'll either have to proceed with the geotechnical investigation or acquire the easements. But I'm not sure why that's an either or. I mean, don't you have to do geotech and environmental regardless? Yeah, I mean, if we get the easement before we do the geotech and the geotech report comes back and says it's so there's something wrong, that could be like we now have the easement where we can't build a tank. So. Is it possible for us to do that? work prior to trying to negotiate i mean we have the right yeah. to go onto the property now so right? the gentleman that owns the property somewhat concerned about heavy equipment on his property so we wouldn't and it's not clear to me if we'd be able to get a drill rig on his property with his consent or if we'd have to use like a minuteman drill and and get some uh data that way if we wanted to wait till after we get the geotechnical report to get the easement um, do we not have an access document agreement, whatever in place to be able to go on to the site? And, we do have an access and, agreement that says no heavy equipment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. That was the missing piece that, oh, okay. I, was, that I wasn't sure about Yeah. because I know we've been negotiating on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let, people won't wait a long time. Um, Let's keep pushing on the guy. Um, let's see. The other one was down on environmental grants. Real quick on grants. Have we um, gotten any other indication we're going to get any more grants? Yes. So we just submitted a USDA funding opportunity for two separate projects. One is through the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County for the Olympia property, fuel reduction around our well sites and removal of invasive species. And then the other is for just general uh, infrastructure protection of, by hardening with wheel reduction. So they both were about $500,000 request. Yeah, those are grants. And those are both grants. Are there any matching or anything like so, that? So uh, they do have a match. I believe it was 25%. Okay. So if we get, got both million dollars, we kick but it. There, it's actually over a four year period. So how we did it was what we had budgeted for fuel reduction would be our match. So there oh, wouldn't okay. be an All increase right. to our budget. It would Got be it. what we have budgeted already. Got it. Okay. Um, in terms of grant um, opportunity velocity, slowing down about the same? It seems that the fuel reduction has slowed down slightly. There's still opportunities coming in, um, but there just isn't as many open right now. Um, I'm assuming in the spring we'll have another show to go after some more funding. So that's usually when they're released. Okay. Okay, okay great. Thanks. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> okay, um, I've got one question. Um, Garrett, at the uh, recent engineering committee meeting, you mentioned um, Highway 9 Caltrans emergency work. And I didn't see that listed on the uh, uh, department summary. Correct. So um, yeah, that was an oversight on my part. Okay. Um, so, so are we making progress on that? Yeah, so we have a survey from Caltrans. Unfortunately, it doesn't go all the way to Lorenzo Avenue. Right. Um, so uh, we've we've sh we've uh, we've drawn up the layout, but it doesn't include one of the sites right. where the pipe is. So we're not going to do forward. this on an emergency then uh, during the week of September when whatever it was tenth. Or no, uh, I'm sorry, November 10th. Yeah, so Caltrans, they have a culvert repair they're going to do on Big Basin Way on right. the 27th. And then I think after they're done with that repair, they would be interested in coming to right. Prospect. So do you think we're going to be able to have something in the way of a design and a, a contractor pricing engaged? or? Yeah, staff's working as fast as we can to okay. get it. Okay, to that point. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I do see a question from one of the members of our uh, public attending remotely, um, Alina Lang. Hi there, Alina Lang, Boulder Creek. Um, I just kind of had maybe quite a question on the, the fish ladder. I know we talked a lot about lamprey passage, and the only thing I've seen is is pictures, so I have not seen it in person. But from the pictures, it looks like it actually ended up with a beveled edge instead of that like four inch radius minimum for lamprey passage. And even below the bevel, there was another couple 90 uh, degrees that, that was in those uh, weirs uh, when they poured the concrete. So I don't know what CDF and W had to say about all this because lamprey, you know, is listed as a species of concern in the state of California. But uh, from the pictures that I saw, it didn't really look like it was meeting the requirements for, for lamprey passage. Um, you know, maybe that was just looking at that wrong, but I'd just be curious that what CDF and W had to say about that and why the that four-inch minimum radius wasn't maintained on all the, the edges so they could uh, pass up and be able to spawn on Fall Creek. Um, thank you. Can I answer you? Can I? Sure. Yeah. So waterways did update the design for the fish ladder to accommodate lamprey passage, and that's how the, the design was completed. Um, the question of the exact radius would be something I'd want to talk with Matt Weld, the engineer, on, but I believe that's that's what we had approved by CDFW as well. So they reviewed that design prior to us okay. completing the work. So Alina, okay. I can follow up with you as well on that. Okay, oh, yeah, that'd be great. I mean, I just saw the picture secondhand. I was like, oh, I, you know, it's hard to kind of make it out, but it definitely looked like a bevel instead of a round. So that'd be great to follow up. Okay. Thanks, Carly. Okay. Uh, without any other questions, then, I think we are done. So uh, we can adjourn. Uh, uh, yes. That was Okay. Okay, that is eight twenty eight adjournment.